What would the medievals want with a burnt owl, a chopped up cat, or dove feces? How do you help a bald man with gout? Or a woman with, quote, blocked menses? If they weren't too complicated, most medicines in the Middle Ages were homemade. Many were quite practical, and most of the ingredients make sense to us because they are still recognizable today. Others are just downright freaky. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Curious Cures By the 14th and 15th centuries, manuscripts were not just found in royal palaces or monasteries. Small remedy books were being made and carried around in people's pockets. Some were as small as 8 centimeters wide and perhaps only 10 centimeters high. These little books were being commercially handwritten to be sold, probably by small bookmakers across Europe. One 15th century example contains a little anonymous poem at the beginning of the book that tells the reader exactly what they are buying. The man that will of leechcraft leer, read over this book and he may hear, many a medicine both good and true, to heal sores both old and new. Herein are medicines without fable, to hear all sores that are curable, of sword, knife, and of arrow, be the wound wide or narrow, of spear, of quarrel, of dagger, of dart, to make him whole in each part. This manuscript was probably copied dozens of times to be sold rather than being commissioned by just one person. Other small books were handmade and added to over the years, like how someone might add food recipes to a ring binder today. With a leather cover and little leather cords on the spine, folded sheets of paper were attached to make a little booklet. This meant that the book could be made bigger and bigger as more notelets were added. Eyes Down There are lots of medieval recipes for ailments regarding eyes and eye infections. This one, unbelievably, has actually been proven to kill the superbug MRSA, which is no mean feat because the bug is antibiotic resistant. First, you must take a crop leek, which is a type of onion, and the same quantity of garlic. Mash them together, then take wine and the gall or bile from a bullock's liver and mix it with the leek. Let the mixture stew for nine nights in a brass container. Pass the mixture through a cloth and clarify well. Put it in a horn and apply it to the eye with a feather at night. The next eye recipe comes from Bold's Leech Book. This medical textbook was written in two parts, in Latin and in Old English, and is thought to have been compiled in the middle of the 10th century. The title doesn't refer to leeches, although they were used a lot in medieval medicine. Translated from Old English, it actually means a book of medical prescriptions. At the end of the second book, a Latin verse states that Bold owns this book, hence the name. For cataracts, or mistiness or web of the eyes, smear the liver secretions from a raw hare's liver on your face, or if that doesn't take your fancy, why not burn periwinkles to ash and mix it with bumblebee honey, then rub directly onto the eye. If there are no periwinkles around, you could use, quote, the fatty parts of all river fishes melted in the sun instead. If the problem is swelling of the eyes, then you could catch a live crab and cut out its eyes and then hang them around your neck. But don't forget to return the blind crab back to the water first. A Recipe for Happiness The German mystic Saint Hildegard of Bingen was famous for her medical recipes in the 12th century and still is today. She seems to have been interested not just in physical well-being, but also in spiritual wellness and mental health. For those who were becoming forgetful, she suggested pounding stinging nettles and a little olive oil together and then rubbing the oil on the temples and chest every night before going to bed. Her recipe for nerve cookies contains, among other things, brown sugar, nutmeg, and cinnamon. It promises to, quote, create a cheerful countenance, glad spirits, and lighten a heavy heart, releasing intelligence. Surprisingly, although she was a Catholic nun, Hildegard had many recipes to help with the retention of the menses which could cause an abortion. It seems they were popular and regularly appeared in household recipe books as blocked menses were seen as a humoral problem in the Middle Ages. It was thought to have been necessary to have a monthly period to expel any evil humours. Not knowing any better, the medievals believed that anyone with psychological problems like schizophrenia was, quote, fiend sick or demonic. In other words, the patient was possessed by the devil who controlled him from within. To cure this, an emetic, or spew drink, had to be made with an infusion of ale and several herbs and plants including fennel, lichen, lupins, and betony. Once holy water had been added, the concoction had to be drunk from a church bell whilst the mass priest sang over the troubled patient. And quote, 
In case a man be lunatic, a porpoise known as Meriswine, which means sea pig, needed to be skinned. Then a whip had to be made out of its hide. When the patient is whipped with it, soon he will be well. Amen. What a load of crap. Animal dung seems to play a huge part in medieval curses. One remedy for tonsillitis or a sore throat recommends taking a white thost, drying it out and crumbling it to a powder before mixing it with honey and rubbing it onto the sufferer's neck. A white thost was another word for a lump of white dog poop. In order to guarantee whiteness, the dog must gnaw a bone ere he drop if the thost, otherwise the cure wouldn't work. Dung and honey also feature in a recipe for joint pain. This time it's dove's dung and a goat's turd that need to be ground and mixed up with the sweet liquid before being rubbed on the affected area. But it's horses, quote, toured, that is dried by the sun or in fire and crumbled to dust before being put in a linen cloth and tied around a wound to stop the bleeding. Whereas what is claimed to be a good wound salve uses cow dung and other ingredients to make a batter to smear on, and goose dung is used in anointment for lung disease. Goat excrement was a main ingredient for burnt ointment, along with wheat stalks and butter. They needed to be mixed together and heated over a fire before being applied to the skin. If you mix some sheep's dung with a hen's egg in a bowl full of ale, that could cure a spider bite. Good luck getting the patient to drink it though. Why not, quote, mingle a turd of an old swine, which be a field goer with old lard, and smear it on a sore shoulder. Snips, snails, and puppy dog tails. As well as their feces, the animals themselves were also popular ingredients. One recipe involves, quote, taking an earthworm and rubbing it thoroughly fine, adding vinegar to bind it and smear within. That will be a good wound solve. For snake bites, a black snail, known to us just as a plain old slug, should be washed in holy water before the patient drinks it, whereas warts can be removed with a mixture of mouse blood and dog urine. Baldness could be cured with a mixture of burned bees and willow leaves, and for the man who tended to overdrink himself, he could try eating five slices of roasted pig lung of an evening. Curing, quote, womb work and pain in the fatty part of the belly involved catching a dung beetle with thy two hands. And after waving him about for a bit and chanting, I make a remedy for the stomach pain, throwing him away over your back. But you must make sure not to turn around and look at him. By doing this, not only could you cure your own stomach ache, but you could also cure others by laying your hands on their belly, at least for the next 12 months anyway. There's a cure for gout, which I'm sorry to inform any of my fellow animal lovers out there. Gout is a very painful swelling of the joints. Today it would be treated with anti-inflammatories, steroids, and a change of diet. In the Middle Ages, you would first need to find an owl before treatment could start. Then, quote, Take the owl and pluck it clean and open it. Clean it and salt it. Put it in a new pot and cover it with a stone and put it in an oven and let it stand till it be burnt. And then pound it with boar's grease and anoint the gout therewith. Disturbingly, another cure for bone ache, as gout was commonly called, was, quote, To take in the month of May a handful or two of sage royal and a great quantity of blackened snails and a quantity of boar's grease. Then take a fat dog whelp suckling upon his dam, so a tiny puppy who is still feeding from his mother, and strip him out of his skin and take his spleen and liver out of his belly and make his belly clean as you can and then put the snails, the sage, and the boar's grease into the belly of the whelp and prick it fast. This means stitching the belly closed. Then put the whelp upon a spit and let him be roast as long as he will drop and receive the dropping in a clean vessel. And when he will drop no more, take him off the spit and chop him all into pieces. And then with a little more boar's grease, frying him as dry as you can and as much moist as you can get of that put into the dropping, and then put it into a glass, and it will look like a green salve, and therewith anoint the patient any time of year when it is needed. There is another very similar recipe that recommends the use of a tomcat rather than a puppy. These medieval recipes provide a detailed and sometimes horribly cruel to animals insight into the medical culture during the Middle Ages. And the recipes remind us of what it was like to live in a precarious and superstitious world without antiseptics, antibiotics, vaccines, and painkillers. Each recipe gives us a little glimpse of the real human stories of the medievals and their fight to live a healthy life free from illness. Some of the most tragic and touching remedies are those that show the dreams and disappointments of life in the Middle Ages, such as a recipe to know whether a pregnant woman carries a boy or a girl, or one to make a man and woman get children, and sadly another that shows how to deliver a woman of a dead child. 
Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please hit that subscribe button and the bell notification if you haven't already. And I'll see you next week for another video. Hope you have a fantastic week. Cheers.